Well, good morning and thank you again for joining us. Uh, we're so thankful for your support and encouragement. And even as we go through this time of transition uh, with Tim uh, moving into a different ministry, we're so excited for he and Chris and just what God has for them in the future. And, and honestly, we're excited for our chaplain team as we look to the future and just wonder what God's up to around here. We're excited about the opportunities that will open up. And again, we're thankful for your support, your prayers, your encouragement to us. And we just covet those prayers in the days ahead. Um, this morning we want to go back to the, uh, the Palm Sunday scene there as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And if you're like me, I'm a person that loves a rags to riches story. You know, one of those stories where somebody, you know, rises out of obscurity, makes their way through the ranks and ends up in a place of fame and prominence and really ends up on a mountaintop. You know, goes from the valley to the mountaintop. And I think we all applaud those kind of stories uh, we're drawn into them. We root for the underdog because we just love it uh, when they end on top. In fact, in the NCAA tournament this year, if you followed that at all, you know there was a team uh, called St. Peter's. Uh, they came from New Jersey, uh, the Peacocks. Uh, they were not well known at all, and uh, they made their way through the tournament and actually found themselves in the Elite Eight. And uh, I find myself rooting for them, even though they were playing Wisconsin, and normally I root for the Big Ten team, but there was something inside of me that just said, yeah, keep going. You know, make your way to the, to the top and uh, win the whole thing. I mean, wouldn't that be something? Now, they didn't do that, and uh, yet we, we love it when uh, we have these rags to riches stories. And uh, if, if you've ever seen the movie uh, Marley and Me, some years ago we watched that movie, I still remember how it ends. You know, this young couple got a yellow lab puppy and this puppy was so mischievous and so it frustrated them so much. But you know, when the puppy grew and it just kind of grew on them and they came to love Marley uh, with all their heart. And then we know that Marley got sick and, and they had to put him to sleep. And, and I found myself saying, no, you know, it's not supposed to end like that. He's the, he's the star of the movie. And yet um, it didn't end the way that I would hoped, I had hoped. And so actually I used about a half a box of Kleenexes because I found myself saying it's not supposed to be like that. And uh, some of you have heard that we have a granddaughter named Natalie and I think I've shared the story before, but it's so cute because Natalie's five years old. She loves to tell stories and you, her little mind is working all the time. She's so creative. And uh, at the end of every one of her stories, she always ends this way. And they lived happily ever after the end. <laughs> And we all love it when the story ends that way. Whether we're little or whether we're uh, older, we all love the way a story ends when it's on the mountaintop, when we live happily ever after, when it ends on a high note. And yet that's not always the case, is it? And we find ourselves frustrated and disappointed. You know, as we look at this picture on the screen of Jesus coming in to Jerusalem, this really was the highest point in Jesus' life and ministry. You can see there that they put him on a donkey, uh, the people were shouting, the people were raising palm branches, they were shouting Hosanna, they laid their coats on the road, you know, they hailed him as the king. And for the Jews, this was kind of like, like their Super Bowl victory parade. You know, this was the highest note in their history because the long-awaited king was finally coming into Jerusalem to save them. And so let's look again at this uh, passage of scripture and just kind of how this story lays out and then we'll look at a few points of application today. In Matthew 21, we read, When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me, and if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth 
in Galilee. So what a high point for the Jews. You know, they hailed him as their king. They shouted, Hosanna. And yet the sad reality is by the end of the week, their story hadn't ended and they lived happily ever after. They, their week ended in disappointment and despair. Their cries of Hosanna turned to crucify. Jesus went from royalty to humility in just five short days. But you know what we're going to see as we look at this passage this morning? That God was still at work. That God keeps his promises. That behind this story, God was up to something. And even in the midst of a divine detour, we're going to see that Easter makes all the difference. And so the story will end on a high note. And so this morning we want to look at the first point. God keeps his word. God keeps his word. And so to God, this story makes perfect sense. To the Jews, it didn't make any sense at all. And for years, they had anticipated Jesus coming because the prophets of the Old Testament had predicted that their coming Messiah uh, would, would come and deliver them and uh, they would reign with him. And I want to look at a couple promises in the Old Testament. Look in 2 Samuel, when the prophet Nathan came to David, the king of Israel, and he gave him this wonderful promise. He said, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever and your throne shall be established forever. Notice how many times in there the prophet uses the word forever. In other words, this one that would come would be the the Savior and the Messiah. And so we see that even though it was partially fulfilled in Solomon, David's son, that there was still a future fulfillment. And that's what we see here as Jesus rides into Jerusalem. We know that in the genealogies in Matthew 1, that if we trace through that genealogy, we see that David is right there in the middle of it. That Jesus came through the line in the lineage of David. And even Mary, when she received the announcement from Gabriel that she'd bear a son, notice what he says to her. In Luke 1, the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Those words sound pretty familiar, don't they? And so Jesus was the fulfillment of these Old Testament promises. And for the Jews, this was their best day ever, because here was their king, here was their Messiah, their Savior. And so he came in riding on a donkey. They laid down the coats there in the palm branches in the road. The people shouted and they hailed him as king as they waved the palm branches, and they cried out, Hosanna, which means save us now. So everything about this scene just cries out, God keeps his word. And he does. And I hope that you're hanging on to some promises today that God gives us in his word that helps us to move forward with confidence and hope. You know, the last few years, I've had to hold on to some promises. There's been some struggles in my life that have really caused me to draw closer to God. And it's been kind of a refining process. A couple of the promises that I've learned to hang on to, one is found in Philippians 1 verse 6, where Paul writes that he who begins a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. There's been days I've wondered what in the world God's up to. And yet I've gone back and I've held on to that promise that God started a work in me so many years ago when I put my trust in Jesus, when I surrendered my life to him, and God's going to be faithful to accomplish that work. Boy, that's been good. And then in Romans 8, 28, we're familiar with verse 28. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And then verse 29, that he might conform us into the image of Christ. You know, even in our tough times, God is up to something. He's molding and shaping us in to the image of Jesus. And so I hope this morning you have some promises that you write down on a three by five card in the middle of life's ups and downs, you can pull those out and find confidence and hope. Because the reality is, and we're gonna see that in this story as we carry on, is that sometimes God brings 
divine detours. <laughs> and Jesus went from royalty to humility. From Sunday to Friday, just five short days, the cries went from save us now to kill him now. So we see that this story goes from the mountaintop to the valley. And I'm sure the Jews were left saying it's not supposed to be like this. And so Jesus came there into Jerusalem. We know one of the first things he did was cleanse the temple. He taught some parables in that last week. Uh, we know that he confronted the Pharisees about their hypocrisy. We know then that he had the Passover with his disciples there in the upper room. He instituted what we know as the Lord's Supper. After that, Judas betrayed him, and Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane where he agonized over the Father's will for his life. We know then that Peter denied him. He went there before Pilate. He was uh, convicted of blasphemy, and then he went to Calvary's cross where he died. So God brought along this divine detour. But the reality is God was still up to something. He was still accomplishing his word. We see there that Jesus' trial, you remember when he went before the governor? Uh, look at what the scripture says about that account. It says, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. So even in the midst of the detour, Jesus was still their long-awaited king. And then there at the cross, you remember the inscription put over the cross? This is what it says. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And remember the leader said to Pilate, No, no, don't write that. You need to write, he said he's the king of the Jews. And Pilate says, I've written what I've written. And so God was still at work. God was keeping his word. God was accomplishing his plan, even in the midst of this divine detour. And on Friday, the Jews were so disappointed and in despair. And look at the scene around the cross. It just showed the confusion and just the blasphemy and the mocking of the people. There in Matthew 27, those passing by were hurling abuse at him. They were wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the leaders, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders were mocking him and they were saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and then we will believe in him. So Jesus went from royalty to humility in just five days. Left the Jews saying, it's not supposed to end like this. And yet God was still up to something. So how do you handle divine detours? Maybe today God's got you in a place that you'd never anticipated. Maybe you don't want. Maybe you don't even like. How do you handle that? You know, for me, there's always an internal struggle. Because I take my circumstances and I match them up with what I've conceived in my mind is the best plan, the best way. And then you add the emotions to it and things get all mixed up. And if I'm, if I'm not careful, my emotions can lead me down a path of unbelief and doubt. And yet, in the middle of all that, God wants us to have faith. He wants us to have a trust in the promises that he's given us that will help steady us. And the hope that we have can be like an anchor for our soul in the middle of those hard times. That's what he wants for our detours. He wants us to abide in him. I'm learning to take one day at a time. You know, I don't look back. I don't look forward. I just commit my day to him. I hang on tight to those wonderful promises. And I find when I do that, I can face the divine detours in my own life with confidence and hope. And so we're going to see today that the reason we can have confidence, the reason we can know that God's up to something and he has a good plan for us is that the third point in our message is Easter makes all the difference. Easter makes all the difference. You know, Jesus rose from the grave and, and uh, we have that account there where the, the ladies went to the tomb and they looked in and, and the, the tomb was empty. The, the stone had been rolled away. And remember then the angel said to them, don't be afraid. And here's why because he's risen just as he said. In other words, the story's gonna end on a high note. We can trust Jesus. And so on Palm Sunday, we see that Jesus was hailed as king. We see royalty. 
by Friday, Good Friday, it was humility. And then again on Easter Sunday, we see that it ends in a victorious way. He ends again in, in royalty. But all through this, God was accomplishing his plan. And Jesus was alive. And the good news is that Jesus rose victorious over the grave. He defeated sin and he defeated death. And when we choose to put our confidence in him, he draws us into a relationship with him. He gives us confidence and hope. He gives us the Holy Spirit that empowers us and gives us courage to keep going, even when life goes a direction that we may not hope for or even planned. And the good news is, is Jesus is reigning now. He's going to come back for us one of these days soon. He's going to take the believers to heaven. And then at the end of the story, he's going to come back on a white horse and he's going to reign victorious. Look what Revelation 19 says. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. And on his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Wow. God's story indeed ends, and we live happily ever after. It ends on the mountaintop. It ends on a high note. Why? Because Easter makes all the difference. We're going to celebrate that next week. Jesus rose victorious from the grave. And the good news is that he wants us to come alongside him on this journey called life. And I hope this morning that your faith and trust is in Jesus. And maybe you're in the middle of a divine detour. Maybe you're wondering if you can really trust God. Is he taking me in the wrong direction? Have we taken a wrong turn or a U-turn? No, in the midst of these divine detours, I want to encourage us to hang on to the promises. And there's a promise that's been especially uh, important to me throughout my life. I memorized it as a, as a young person. And uh, it's, a, it's a passage found in Jeremiah 29. This was written to a people who were in the middle of a divine detour. They were in a place that they didn't like, that they didn't want to be, and uh, they wished was different. And the reality is they were there because of their own disobedience and wrong. And yet God came to them in the midst of this detour and look at the promise that he gave them. It's a great promise for us today as well. This is what it says, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and to give you a future. So where's your story find you at today? Are you on the mountaintop? Are you in the valley? Are you finding yourself on a, a detour in life that maybe you hadn't planned on? I want to encourage you that God keeps his word. You can trust him and keep following him. I also want to encourage us that even in the midst, midst of divine detours, God's there. He hasn't forgotten about us. He's right there with us. He's walking this path with us and he'll walk us all the way to our heavenly home. And how do we know that that's true? Because Easter makes all the difference. Our King, our Messiah, our Savior is alive. So let's keep trusting Him as we move forward and let's be confident if your faith is in Jesus that our story will end and we live happily ever after the end. Father, we just thank you for this wonderful reminder this morning that even though your people uh, hailed Jesus as their King when He came in there to Jerusalem, uh, they cried out, save us now. Uh, God, that even at the end of the week when, when their plans and hopes and dreams had taken a detour, that God, you were still up to something. God, you were still going to bring a good out of bad, that, that your story ends on the mountaintop in, in victory. And God, we thank you for Easter Sunday. And as we look forward to celebrating that next week, I just pray that you'd give us hope and confidence as we move through our lives, that we can trust your promises. I pray that we'd hang on tight that we trust you by faith, we know that you're a good God that's always working out a good plan. And God, we thank you that the reality is that when we follow Jesus, when we put our trust in him, our story always ends happily ever after. We're so thankful for that. We praise you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen.